He said um, that he hoped the new year would give you courage to break your resolutions as quickly as possible. <laughs> so I don't know whether you already have, and that advice is superfluous or whatever. Okay. So Anna's Crowley is going to be my topic. Um, the man who was called the most evil man in England. That's quite a quite a thing, isn't it, to be able to to claim that? Because when I was thinking about this talk and trying to decide, you know, what who to talk about, I too had a dilemma, and I, I, I thought I'd like to talk about somebody who had a reputation for evil. Um, because they're always the more interesting people, aren't they? Not that I'm saying that anybody here who isn't evil isn't interesting, just in case you misunderstood me there. And so I had a choice, didn't I, between two people who have both got a reputation of evil and connected with Eastbourne, and the choice was between Theresa May and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided I'd go for the better known one. <laughs> now, you may have noticed that my pocket is bulging. Please, no obvious jokes connected with old Hollywood film stars. Why have I got, what is this bulge in my pocket? Does anybody know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> You're not incriminating yourself by any accident. Anything that, well, look, I'll show it to you. It's will give you a clue. What is it? It's supposed to be a pebble. I say it's supposed to be a pebble because actually it's a fake. It's just taken off my gas bar at the last minute because I forgot to get a pebble for this evening. But nevertheless, it's meant to be a pebble. Why might I have a pebble in my pocket? Feel mad. <laughs> <laughs> we're not just dealing with what's incontestable. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to speculate. So basically it's because I did the Hastings for a bit. And according to Alistair Crowley, the only way you can leave Hastings is if you always have a pebble in your pocket. And so I always find one of these is rather useful if I'm coming over to territory like this one. So that's, that's uh, an Alistair Crowley prop, you might say. Okay, the most evil man in England. So when I started looking at the his story, I, I sort of wondered, what is he really like? And I made an extraordinary discovery, a discovery which amazed me, and that he was in fact a polymath, a genius, you might say, he was a painter, a poet, a chess player of considerable distinction, a mountaineer of world fame, a mystic, an explorer, the founder of the religion, and a magician. Now there's a person who has lived his life to the full. This is Alistair Crowley. But above all else, he was a rebel. Now why was he a rebel? Well, he was a rebel for the same reason that everybody becomes a rebel. He had a lot to rebel against. He was brought up in a family of Plymouth Brethren. Now the Plymouth Brethren believed themselves to be saved and so they call each other Saint. So you would say for example Saint Tim or Saint Richard because unless you follow the strict lines of the Plymouth Brethren the jaws of hell are gaping in front of you. And so it was a very severe, very authoritarian, very puritanical kind of upbringing uh, that he was objected to. The only book he was allowed to read at home was the Bible, okay? So what sort of effect did this have upon him? Well, he was a very intelligent person. Intelligent people like to ask questions. Intelligent people doubt things, don't they? So one of the things that happened to him was his mother, in a, probably a singular moment of jokiness, because she was not exactly renowned for her sense of humour, um, his mother said to him, ladies, she said, do not have legs. And that's why they wear long skirts. It has not been recorded what they had instead as a means of locomotion. But not surprisingly, Alistair Crowley thought this was an implausible story. And he decided to put it to the test. And he decided to do so, choosing as his victims two personal tutors of his, women whom he disliked. Okay, And the way in which he did it was this. Before they came in, he hid under a table like this. I'm not actually going to demonstrate. He hid, I will admit, he, did, he hid under a table, okay, tablecloth here. And when the women approached the table, he peered out from his vantage point, stared up into their nether regions, and realised the truth. He then jumped out from under the tablecloth and said, You're not a lady, you have, you've got legs, my mother said so. Now, this is an example, I think, of Crowley as a very independent, minded individual. A person who wanted to find things out for himself, 
and who was not prepared to take anything on trust. Now, his father was a very religious man, but a man whom he personally respected as a fair person. Nevertheless, as I said, there was this enormous Puritanism within the family. I mean, it was there in the whole of Britain, but it was particularly marked in his family. And so when he went off to school, and I have to tell you that this talk is, I'm afraid, not PG rated, so I have to warn you about that. And this will become apparent now. When his father sent him off to school, his parting words were not, Hello, go, go, have a good time, you know, hope you get on with the teachers. Don't forget to study well, always do your homework, you know, nothing to be afraid of. No. What he said to him was, under no circumstances must you touch your private parts. <laughs> this was the parting that he had when he was sent off to school. And you can imagine the kind of effect that that would have. Could I have a time, my daddy? I won't, I won't do it, honestly, I promise you. <laughs> this was the way in which he was brought up, okay? Now... Things then went from bad to worse, because I said he did rather like his father, but his father died when he was 12 years old. That is something which has an effect upon people psychologically. It normally has the effect, or not normally, but it not infrequently has the effect of making the person who has suffered this ambitious in later life. And this was certainly true with him, because he wanted to be outstanding. So I think that's something that, um, in some ways, I think he, he achieved that. Okay. The home life then got worse because his mother was highly critical of him and brought into the house her brother, um, who was a very, very devout Christian. And poor old Alistair was on the receiving end of an enormous amount of criticism. Um, he was seen as a naughty boy, not surprisingly. And um, things got just worse and worse and worse. Um, I've already referred to this sort of experimental spirit of his, but also he was on the receiving end of a lot of cruelty. And obviously that comes out, doesn't it, in the way in which somebody behaves. So when his mother told him, it must have been very unwise to say anything to young Alistair, that a cat had nine lives. Yes, you know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> he stole a cat, dosed it with arsenic, chloroformed it, gassed it, stabbed it, smashed its skull, slit its throat, drowned it, and dropped it out of the top story window, and then proclaimed it dead. And I think you can argue that something of this sort of sadomasochism comes into his sexual practices later on in his life. But you can see how profound the influence of Alistair Crowley has had upon culture, that this inspired the illustrators of an ITA book to include a cat. <laughs> <laughs> they clearly met a very similar effect. <laughs> so, Alistair Crowley then um, grew up in this environment. He, he then went off to school. A lot of his school experiences were also unpleasant. Experiences of bullying and buggery, basically. Typical public school of that time. And the result of this was that he became very transgressive. Now, a little interlude now. Um, ah, let's see if we can get a picture of it. Here he is, when he was still quite young. And here is the... Oh, oh that's just simply show very quick. This is from a Birmingham newspaper when he died. And it shows you how important he was that a Birmingham local newspaper regarded his front page news when somebody died in Brighton. This will give you an idea of how important he was seen as being. Back to him. And now, we come to Eastbourne. We have here the Devil's Chimney probably named so by Crowley himself. When he came to Eastbourne as a teenager, he decided that he would climb this and also climb this. Now, if you know anything about climbing, and I don't, you, you will know that this is a, a short face and therefore supremely difficult to climb, very difficult to get a toehold, absolutely sheer, and yet he and his friends managed to climb this and also beachy head. People did not believe that this was possible, okay? And luckily, he had not only witnesses, but also photographic evidence. And on the basis of this, while still a teenager, he was elected to the Scottish Mountaineering Club, secondly by one of the most famous mountaineers in the entire world. And he went on to climb the second highest mountain in the world and to set altitude and endurance records. This is just one of the facets of this multifaceted person. But 
now I go back to my main theme again. Some of the pictures of this, this has now fallen down. As you may know, Crawley predicted, Cranley predicted, that if this ever was to fall, Eastbourne would be ruined. This doesn't seem yet to have happened. Okay? <laughs> but not mainly a curse, just a prediction, but there it is. So that's another Eastbourne connection. His mother lived here in later life, and he frequently popped back to Eastbourne to see her. So he was a frequent visitor to the town. And here he is in ceremonial clothes as a magician. Now, Alistair Crowley, I have said, is basically a trans becomes a transgressive figure. And I'm going to argue that he's possibly one of the most transgressive people there have ever been. Because if we think of people who are transgressive or seen in that way, very often their individual lives, their private lives, were quite conventional. If you take somebody like Karl Marx, he led a fairly conventional life. He, was a, he wrote for the Times newspaper, you know, a very respectable newspaper then as now, or maybe more then than now. But, um, so, so, but, but Crowley was not only transgressive in what he said, he was transgressive in what he did. Okay? Now, I just want to quickly, because I'm not going to do the biography in detail, just give you an idea of how much he packed into a life. He climbed mountains, explored India and China, studied Buddhism and Hinduism, wrote the first accurate book about yoga in English, and introduced yoga to the West, practiced magic, founded the religion, designed the tarot cards which are the most common in use today, wrote the best book on magic for a hundred years, had a lot of sex, a great deal of sex, and consumed vast quantities of alcohol and drugs. This is what D.H. Lawrence called uh, sensuous, no, spontaneous sensuous fullness of being. Yes? What a life. What a, an extraordinary variety of things to pack into a single life. Now, I'm just going to say a few words now, just about some of the ways in which he was transgressive. What he was primarily was a magician, not the kind of magician who works by, ma uh, by illusion or by mechanism or by mass hypnosis, but as he would see it, using paranormal powers to make an impact upon the physical world. That was the way in which he did it. And in private he did it by using what he called sex magic. He saw sex as the way to put yourself into the frame of mind in which magic was most likely to work. He saw himself as actually incorporating sex within magic. Okay? So you, you'll realise his kind of magic was not the kind of magic that you would get if you were married to Paul Daniels, for example, <laughs> there was no way in which it was a preparation for a career on Celebrity Come Dancing. <laughs> very, very difficult. Very difficult. So, in what, in what way was he transgressive? Firstly, society then said the only kind of sexuality allowable was heterosexuality. So that Rad Radcliffe Hall wrote a lesbian novel, uh, and that novel was seized by the police and nobody was allowed to see it. If you read the published novels of D.H. Lawrence, something like Sons and Others, you will see there are no explicit references to sex, just to waterfalls and running streams, and you've got to put two and two together. And that's a writer who was seen as, as you know, later on, seen as though she a pornographic novelist. Whereas Crowley was gloriously, unashamedly, okay, flamboyantly bisexual. He wrote about his bisexual life, he gloried in it, he made no attempt to disguise it, and at a point where you could be imprisoned for being homosexual, it is quite remarkable that he escaped the clutches of the police. And we're good there. He also regarded, and this was part of the magic ceremonies, he regarded anal sex as um, not only wrong, sorry, not only not wrong, and I think this is a, a very interesting, yes, uh, that might have been a Freudian step, or it might not <laughs> I, I'd, like, I'd like to be I'm too broad-minded for that, but you never know, do you? Okay. He regarded anal sex as not simply not bad, but he regarded it as magical, as sacred, and he used it as an important part of his magical ceremonies. So you can see they were not the sort of thing, you know, that were, were, were featured on Saturday night at the Apollo. They were a little bit more private than that, um, and for obvious reasons, okay? But, but just to notice that at the point this was very much regarded as a sexual perversion and, and that he did not see things in that light. 
He believed that what you want to do, you should do. And this was the central tenet of the religion he founded, which he called Thelema. Okay? Now, the central point of this, the central message was, do what thou wilt is the hall of the law. His upbringing had taught him that repression and suppression were evil. And he associated those things, by the way, with the Christian God. And so what he thought we all needed, and I don't think he was wrong in this, what he thought was we need liberation. And so his aim was to liberate himself and to liberate others through his religion. And when he says, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, he doesn't actually mean just being self-indulgent. What he means, what he believed was, that if you followed your will, and we all followed our will all the time, then we would not do things that are perverted and cruel, because he thinks perversion and cruelty is the result of repression. Okay? And so that's rather important. Also, of course, society by that time had started to say that drugs were bad. It had been possible in 1900, both in America and in Britain, just to go into a chemist shop and buy whatever you wanted, no restrictions whatsoever. But in both countries, a dangerous drug act had been introduced, and there was a very different attitude towards drugs um, in the second half of Crowley's life. Crowley was an enthusiastic taker of drugs, and he saw them in the same way as people did later on in the 1960s and 1970s. He saw they were a path to self-knowledge, to otherwise inaccessible uh, spiritual experiences, and to heightened perception. So you can see why he was taken up later on by hippies and uh, rock stars as an example of a forerunner, a trailblazer, if you like, of the kind of uh, lifestyle which they wished to lead. All right. Now, the most controversial thing about him was that he was believed to be associated with the devil. He played up to this. If you met him at a party and said, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, he would say 666. Okay? Or he would say the beast. So there was a part of him that was narcissistic, self-advertising, um, enjoyed being a, a social provocateur, who was actor shock and who gloried in the attention it brought him. But he was also a very, very serious-minded and intellectual writer who thought deeply about things. And he took an interesting view of the devil. He thought, basically, the devil had a bad press. And that because we had associated evil with the devil, and because he no longer believed that evil came from the devil but came instead from repression, he had a different view of the devil. For him, the devil was a person with knowledge of good and bad, a spirit with knowledge of good and bad, but rather like a difficult horse. In other words, if you can imagine, I saw a film about this before Christmas. There was this teenage girl from a working class family in America. And she goes to the stable with all these posh people who are snobbish and they look down at her. And there's this horse. Nobody can ride this horse, of course, so we know it's a Hollywood girl. How is it going to happen next? Yes, she is going to be able to mount it. She's going to make friends with it. She's going to turn into an ally. And of course, she's going to triumph. And that's how Crowley saw the devil. He saw the devil as a horse that he could ride and that he could control. And the same was true as other spirits with, you know, traditionally evil connotation. He could control them. Now, what you might wonder then is whether or not he was right. Uh, I'm going to, now, this is a painting by him, and it shows the, the way in which the ideas of good and evil were to him very closely related. This is a Buddha, but you see he's got the mark of the devil, 666, on him. So he didn't, he was, ra he was so radical, he didn't accept the division into good or bad, God and devil. He didn't accept that. That was part of his total rejection of the way in which people saw things. Now, I'm not going to read this out. I'll tell you why. Because I'm of a nervous disposition. And if this was read in a blind, Brian Blessed sort of voice, <laughs> this would become very, very effective. Try reading from here. He's addressing Satan. Read it to yourself as if you are trying to invoke the devil and bring him into this room. You can see how he's associating Satan, which to him is ambiguous, with sex, because him for good. Okay? So you can see a totally radical way of looking at these things. Now then, 
This is a little quote then, a little final conclusion, if you like. Crowley was then a liberator, a trailblazer, an intellectual, somebody who lived life totally to the thought, a rebel, a transgressive person who went against every law and every taboo that he could possibly do. But a little question, this business about the devil. Was he really in charge of that horse? Or was that horse running away with him and him holding on to the pommel for dear life like this and pretending he was really in charge of the horse? And if evil forces had power over him and they were supernatural, could they survive his death? Two stories. This is from a group who decided to use an image of Crowley on their record sleeve. As you can see, he's got Mickey Mouse ears, which was a very popular little thing to do before Christmas. I saw one with Trump with Mickey Mouse ears. So, that was rather daring, wasn't it? You might imagine that Crowley would be none too pleased about that. So what happens? The person who designed this died of a drug overdose shortly afterwards. A member of the band committed suicide. Bad things happened to the other members of the band as well. And, oh, that's gone back to there. Sorry. Um, that's it. That's, 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 that's that. Second story. Second story. I need to emphasise before I tell you this story that Crowley believed that magic was just part of the natural world. So to get power over the spirits, the spirits were natural. Okay. I've also told you he consumed a lot of drugs. So as he was dying in Netherfield in Hastings. His doctor, rather bravely you might think, decided that he should cut down on his heroin intake. <laughs> this what? Yes, yes, because the idea is, you know, do what thou wilt, because he would will to go on taking the drugs. So the doctor would not relent, so Crowley cursed the doctor. Crowley died. 24 hours later, the doctor was found dead in his bath. And the certificate said, natural causes. Thank you very much. Richard, that's a, a brilliant, brilliant insight into someone that uh, I, I think I've always been a bit <laughs> wary of Alistair Crowley in terms of uh, my knowledge and understanding of it, but you've exposed it in a, in a, in a brilliant, brilliant way. He clearly was a very talented guy who was also into and interested in loads and loads of things. Does anybody have any questions? Any, you any... probably know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um... Alistair Crowley, rich man, I assume, probably inherited his father's estate. Did he when he died at twelve? Uh, so this is a man. Sorry, go on. Go, go, go on, go on. So this is a man who could do as he wanted. I imagine if he, if it was, if he'd grown up in a poorer family, uh, he'd probably just end up some nutcase in a prison somewhere. Um, but because he didn't, he, he didn't seem to get arrested or anything like that, and he could sort of perhaps buy himself out of any predicament he got into. Yes, um, it's sort of interesting. Um, he, his, his parents owned um, a brewery, which is extremely unusual to the Brethren. They owned a brewery, Crowley's Elves. They were very, very well known. And he also ran um, a chain, or his family ran a chain, of the antecedents of wine bars. And so the name of Crowley was already quite well known. It was like being called a combination of Ruddles and Weatherspoons in a way. <laughs> so you're, you're already sort of known as a name. He inherited, when he was at university, a sum of money, the equivalent of about £12 million pounds in modern money. So he was a very, very rich undergraduate indeed. But he spent his money. He self-published, lavishly, making sure that all his books were beautifully produced, highly expensive operation. And also, um, he financed some of these mountaineering expeditions on which they would employ up to 300 people to assist them. And so his money ran out. And so later on in life, um, he was quite short of money, and he actually made the mistake, um, eventually, of trying to sue somebody who had um, libeled him, uh, hoping he'd make some money out of it, and like Oscar Wilde, he lost the case. So he was quite, quite strapped for money in later years, but he got money from some of these magical societies to keep him going. But your point's an excellent one. It's all very well to say, do what you will, 
Because he was in a financial position to do it, you're absolutely right. I yes. expect he, he, he was a bit like um, an enforcer. If he, if he asked someone for a bit of money or put a curse on him, he'd probably get the money, wouldn't he? I think you might be a bit <laughs> reluctant to say no. Um, when he went bankrupt, he had 130 creditors, which apparently is extraordinary. Okay, because people gave him money. But he was well known, he was well connected, so people may have thought, well, if you're a friend of Somerset Morn and all this sort of thing, then probably, you know, you'll find the money somehow. Mm. Brilliant, excellent. Any more, any more, uh, sort? yes, come on, yeah. I'd love to, a great talk, by the way. Um, I'd love to know more about his connection to yoga. You said something about um, mm. he was involved in um, the bringing yoga. That's right. The yeah. Yeah. I'm not an expert on this, but I've read that he, he wrote the first book, they gave an accurate account. There were other sort of accounts of yoga, but they had kind of, um, they had kind of been contaminated with what are called ori orientalist, you know, misperceptions, if you like, kind of the imperial way of looking at foreign cultures, okay? But he, he was very sympathetic towards and interested in, genuinely interested in, um, various practices. Another one was meditation. So he, he meditated, as well as doing yoga. So, I mean, that's all I can tell you, I'm afraid, but, uh, yes. But that would have been in the early 1900s, then, which is... Um, it, well, he was born in 1875. Um, he was into meditation by the time he was at university. So, he, he went about, say, 21, so 1896. Yoga, I think, about 1905. I'd yeah. be able to shed some light on Ah, brilliant. There is a tribe called the Agora tribe where yoga has derived from, and they, are, they practice cannibalism, <coughs> and drinking their own urine, they're quite dark, they are feared among societies in India, and I imagine a man like that would be taken by one of those things, he could probably follow up with that concept. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, of course. Yes, he wasn't afraid of, he wasn't afraid of bodily fluids. No, neither of <laughs> them. <laughs> no, no, no. Quite simply, he wasn't. Any, no, no. <laughs> any, any, last, any last questions? Thank you. For, but yes, thank you. Any, yes, yeah, it's more of a comment, really. Um, I don't know quite where I've got it from, but I believe that this idea of the beast and 666 is actually a mistranslation. Um, and the, the, the number of the beast is 616. Ah. Uh -huh. And if anybody would like to maybe follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, there's yeah, a, maybe there's a Bavar Bar talking. There, there may well be. I mean, it, it, one of the things there is that. Um, it was his mother who decided he was the beast. Right. His mother started calling him the beast because of the way in which he behaved. And then he sort of took it up, you know, in the way in which you can kind of, I don't know, you can kind of sort of the Ramona or something yeah. like that. Well, it, as comes a march from, of, you know. it comes from revelations. Yes, it? that's right. And yes. it's a mistranslation yes. in, in whatever popular... Interesting, country. yes. You know, Interesting. The time was it yes. It's poetic to be 666, six, 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 but in fact it's... Yes. So watch out. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. When I was younger, I went to see the film The Exorcist. And when I got home to my station, which was then in East London, Newbury Park, I saw the bus looming out of the mist, and it was a 66. And I thought, my God, you know. <laughs> so, so, so if it had been a 61, it wouldn't have meant anything. But yes, OK, right, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Right, well, it's, uh, it's nearly 20%, so I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, call it there in terms of uh, Alistair Crowley and talk. So can we just thank Richard? Thank you so much, Richard.